Barry Bernardi was the producer, and a really great guy, a lot of fun. And I think they wanted Dick Smith as our consultant, which, you know, is pretty amazing. So uh, Dick really made that film happen for me and for us. Without him, we would, I don't think we've got, we would have gotten the job. So uh, Dick was key. And my job on Poltergeist 3 was basically not so creative, but, you know, somewhat creative, but to facilitate all of the effects and Dick Smith's designs. We had Kevin Haney back again, Stefan Dupuy, who I did scanners a little bit with, and Quest for Fire. We were kids designing Quest for Fire together, me and Stefan. And so we were lucky to get Stefan to help go, do a lot of the applications in Chicago with Kevin. While Doug and I were back in the lab, you know, designing and working on stuff with Dick Smith. And uh, so we had a super crew. We also had our shop manager, Anthony Fredrickson, who was a great guy. And that was the core team. Not a big team, but the core. Really just a lot of talent, a lot of talent there. Just to have Dick Smith involved was an honor and a privilege. Stay back. Stay back. He's got the girls and now he wants you. What are you talking about? The preacher came. He knows that as long as there's someone on this side that loves him, you can get them back. Zelda was amazing because we had to do a lot with her. You know, we had to do dummies, take a body cast and do the whole thing. And and then we had to do a, a, like, like a rotted corpse of her where I think it's uh, Lara Flynn Boyle tears out of her body. So we did a lot with her, and she came to our shop in Brooklyn a lot, and we did body cast and head cast of her, and she was just a, a beautiful person to work with. That was tricky, the whole thing where she comes out of the Lara, Lara from Boyle rips out of Zelda Rubenstein like mummified corpse that took weeks of of planning Doug did a lot of that with me and first of all they made a fake floor an elevated floor that we could get Lara from Boyle under the floor so we tricked out the floor it was a special set and then we Doug and I had to come up with materials that you could actually tear away and break away and it would look like fluffy kind of mummified skin and we I think Doug and I were like working out pie crust we had books on you know uh, crepes and pie crust and and we were actually building like bread and stuff in the lab with combinations of wax like a wax skin but the whole thing was sculpted first in clay and then we made a mold a rubber mold of the clay sculpture and then we had to work from the inside of the mold with wax like brown wax I think we used and then we used parts of like dried pie crust and pizza dough and it, you know it's amazing what you have to what you have to learn on each film and we put the slime and drool all over it. it's it's amazing what actors go through for us really it's really it's amazing no go away go away dick smith really sculpted and designed all the carol ann stages of kane's makeup where she's transitioning into the Kane character. And those are basically, basically are really all of Dick Smith's designs. So he would, we would give him the life cast of Carol Ann, the plaster cast, and Dick went back to his shop in Larchmont and sculpted these beautiful old age makeups on this little face, which are, are remarkable. I didn't really get to work with Heather too much because Dick basically designed those makeups, and then Stefan and Kevin applied them in Chicago while Doug and I and the crew and Dick were back in the shop in New York building things and sending them to Chicago. Kane! Give her back her family! Nathan Davis, yeah, I actually sculpted that one, and that was, that was a lot of fun. The whole idea was that 
we can never really do an identical makeup. So my my job was to do a likeness makeup. And so, um, you know, there were little pieces that I designed for his mouth and his nose and his face and then the, the wig and the contact lenses. And then I think the dentist in New York came through Dick Smith and he designed these beautiful teeth, these beautiful big like skeletal choppers. and. And so the whole design ethic for Kane was to do a good likeness and scary makeup. And the actor was really great. Nathan Davis really, really brought it. It was great. Come to me, Caroline. We need you. Caroline. Caroline. Dick Smith had some input in that makeup. And so the idea was to never lose the Nathan Davis in the makeup. It was just to kind of gild the lily there. And it was a fun sculpt. I got to do that one myself, and that was a lot of fun for me. Oh. <laughs> and they thought it was her. <laughs> Sherman was very, you know, specific in all the mirror type things, all the you know, reflections in mirrors and using, tricking out mirrors and doing things like that. So we had dummies that we used of Carol Ann and flying dummies of Zelda Rubenstein and her and, and uh, using the real actors and then doing lifelike dummies of them and using them for mirror effects. So yeah, he was very involved in that. We had things where we had fake hands on one side of a mirror and the actor holding the other side with their hand. You know, we were really, you know, doing multiple images of things and, and um, it was, it got complicated. It got very complicated, but it was really, it was, it was used to the max in that film. We really had to work very closely with the special effects department um, because everything was done on the floor. There were no real optical effects, you know, mirror tricks and camera tricks. And so, yeah, it was a real, you know, we really had to work closely with Dick Smith, special effects, uh, set deck, where they would build special sets, you know, risers for floors, fake floors and things. Yeah, it was a collaborative uh, design ethic on that film. I don't really remember uh, any real glitches on Poltergeist. It was very well planned out. We had early, early on, we, we had big production meetings at my shop in Brooklyn and where all the department heads would fly in from LA. So, you know, Barry Bernardi was very careful in choreographing each scene, you know, being the good producer he is. Um, so there was really no guessing. And once we left those meetings, what each department was designing and creating for each other. So, you know, it was, it was very well choreographed and very well produced. Did I ever tell you how to make a little girl laugh? Never did. Well, it takes a lot of practice. First thing you gotta do, you stick them right here under the ribs. <laughs> The atmosphere was always good. It was create. I mean, you you this this job, this particular movie, you needed all the other departments. You needed the camera department. You needed the lighting department, the special effects, the floor effects, uh, the director's vision, the the makeup. Yeah, you know, everybody. It was really a collaborative. No, nobody could do it alone. So the 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 atmosphere was very creative, very tight, and it was. I think Gary. I, I, the, the director came from an ensemble group. I don't know if it was Stephen Wolf in Chicago or some some group, but it felt like an ensemble that he created on the set, and that that was great. I do remember that kind of close cooperation between all the departments, which was key on that picture. Final thoughts. Um, uh, I, I probably they probably not use this on camera, but this is if Barry Bernardi sees this, I want to thank him for um, hanging in there with his department, especially when we uh, at one of our big production meetings in Brooklyn. It was one thing that was it was we felt a little tension, you know, early on. You know, it was like trying to figure this thing out. So to break the tension and to like really have a good time with the producers, we actually hired a stripper 
to come into a product. This will never be used, but we actually hired a stripper to come in at one of the key poltergeist meetings. And Dick Smith was there, and all the, the, the department heads were there, and, and Barry Bernardi was there, and some the director. And we had the stripper come in and at the meeting. We had been half, got halfway through the meeting, and she was in a three-piece business suit with a briefcase. And she shows up, and she says, I'm here for the Poltergeist 3 meeting. And everyone's looking at me. And it was like the most incredible rush that either I'm going to blow this movie, and Dick Smith will never deal with me again, or I, we didn't know what was going to happen. It was like it was like jumping out of a plane without checking your parachute. The adrenaline rush, and uh, Barry Bernardi's looking at me. The producer, Dick Smith's like, "Who is this person?" And I'm like, "I don't know." And she starts to, you know, take off her clothes and pulls out a boombox and starts. And we had her dance to Dick Smith with a boa. And many years later, fate to many years later, uh, I've worked a lot with Al Pacino. And uh, over the years, you know, Dick Tracy, and he's requested me for many movies. And uh, I get a call. I'm driving my car in New York. I'm on this movie, Tower Heist. And it's Barry Bernardi, the producer, who's producing the movie Jack and Jill. And Pacino's in it, and Pacino's requested me to do his makeup. And the first thing the voice says on the phone is, uh, is this the John Caglione Makeup Stripping um, Association? And, and I'm like, Barry. Barry, please forgive me. I'm sorry. And it, and he did forgive me. Hopefully, and it, it was a big laugh. But that's one of the big memories I have of Poltergeist Three. And it has nothing to do with the movie. It has nothing to do with makeup. And it will never make it in the final cut. Hopefully, it will not. You should cut this right out of the movie.